Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, we have a great panel here today. I'm Katie Garrett. I'm with David M. Schwartz Architects. Our panelists from the far end, uh, we have Bob Campbell with FDA Associates, Theater Planning Group, Russ Todd with Acoustics, they are acousticians, and Craig Williams, who's the principal with David M. Schwartz Architects and has led many of our performing arts projects. Um, our three firms and various principals from those firms have worked on um, many performing arts projects together. Today we're going to walk you quickly through a case study with some fundamentals on a project we did together in Nashville, Tennessee called the Skirmish Horn Symphony Center and give you a little bit of background on acoustics and, um, and theater planning and the things that go into the making of the room before we open it up to a panel discussion um, among these guys to hear all the great stories they have to tell from those projects. So I'm going to turn it over to Craig Williams to start off this morning. Good morning. Um, Y'all here? Yes, good morning. Um, so yeah, as Katie said, we're going to run through quickly a slide presentation just to give you some background information on the project that we're going to use as the basis for a panel discussion to talk about the collaborative efforts, the synergy between architect, acoustician, and theater planner. Um, so this is you know, an AIA presentation, the typical boilerplate stuff here. We're not going to sell you anything, but we will talk about projects we've done together. Um, and then learning objectives. Um, the, we're going to start by just establishing the basic design goals for a truly integrated performance venue um, design process. Um, we need to understand that acoustics are prime, that um, if it becomes a battle between architect, theater planner, or acoustician, and you end up going to the client, acoustics will win. So there's a um, incentive to cooperate with each other. Um, we are going to go over the um, sound um, planning and design principles that create these integrated solutions. Um, um, go over some of the special challenges that the performing arts venues have that make them way more complicated than almost any other um, building type. And then lastly, because you all get health, safety, and welfare credits for this course, um, we hope we instill the fact that um, good venues soothe the mind and body. Um, otherwise, I couldn't figure out exactly what the health, safety, and welfare was in here, but we'll take it. We'll all take it. Um, past collaborations. Um, we first worked together on Bass Hall in Fort Worth, Texas, a multi-use theater. Design on this project began in 1993, so this is a 20-year long collaboration between um, the three firms and the principals and people within them. Um, after that, we went on to work on the expansion and um, renovation of Severance Hall for the world-renowned Cleveland Orchestra, one of the best clients one could ever wish to have. Um, we then had the opportunity to work together on Skirmerhorn Symphony Center in Nashville, Tennessee, um, a sort of pure concert hall building with a couple interesting new takes on the building type. Um, I want to shout out to Michelle Cohn in the audience who used to work with us and worked on this project as well. So. Um, Real credit there. Um, we, we then went on to do a three hall venue, the Smith Center for the Performing Arts in Las Vegas, Nevada, that opened a little more than two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, and currently we are working on the Gilliard Center in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a complete um, rebuild of the largest hall that Spoleto USA uses there in Charleston. Um, so, before getting into these goals and the basics of, of the design here, um, I don't know if anybody here attended the lecture I gave last year on Acoustics 101. Um, if you did, you'll recognize a few slides. Um, if you didn't, um, you won't be set back or anything, but the, the people, the person, I should say, that was here last year will have a little better, better idea of how sound bounces around in, in these things and creates what we all hear. Um, the design of these buildings are one-third art, one-third science, 
and one third black magic. And the black magic part of it is primarily um, provided by Russ and the whole theory of the two I forgot theory. to bring my cape. <laughs> he left his chickens um, at home. <laughs> um, but, but they have rules and goals of what you're trying to attain. Oops. And um, th these are all somewhat complex terms. Some of them are um, counter to each other. Some of them work hand in hand with each other. But notions of clarity, um, base response, warmth in the room, <coughs> impact. I, as an architect, like to call it slam. Um, resonance, you, you probably have heard of reverb time and everything like that, and, and that's, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit. Um, envelopment is really feeling like the sound is all around you and it's not the little Barbie dolls playing on the stage. Um, and then silence and, and the quiet background of the room is part of what makes it all um, listenable. <laughs> you hear. Um, frequency and wavelength is a really key part of understanding how sound works. And um, the, the notes of the symphony orchestra, the wavelengths are from you know, less than an inch to um, 30 feet or more. And every element in the room, different sound waves will respond to it differently depending upon the frequency and the size of the element and the spacing of the elements in the room. So it's, it's important that um, your, your <coughs> Russ on your team teaches you what you need to know about all that stuff to get along. Um, this is a plan of the Music for Einsall in Vienna. It's kind of the mother church of classical music. And we're going to use it as an example to real, quick, real quickly tell you how sound works. Um, and that is there's the rec sound that goes from the instrument on the concert platform to the listener. Um, that gives you things like localization, clarity, etc. Um, you then get the early reflections coming off of sidewalls and other elements that are quick and direct and that emphasizes that presence and strength of the music. But then you get millions and millions of reflections that arrive at the ear nanoseconds apart during the um, reverb time, um, which depending upon frequency and depending upon the room and your goals, you're trying to keep something greater than two seconds, even two and a half seconds. Um, Greg, one, one comment. What's important uh, in your <coughs> thinking about these lateral reflections is that the width of the room that really determines how loud they are. So one of the fundamental criteria in, in designing a, a concert hall space is setting that initial uh, room width. And Vienna is known to be a fairly narrow uh, room and loud. And so the same thing that's happening in plan is also happening in section, which is you get those direct sounds coming at you, you get the early reflections bouncing off of the low side walls and the undersides of the first tier or so, but then you get those millions and millions of um, sounds arriving nanoseconds apart, and as Russ just said, the real key is the width of the room. Um, then we get to the notion of psychoacoustics. And um, real quickly, this is the concept that there are things like what you, what you see and other things, the comfort of your seat, <coughs> et cetera, that can impact your um, perception of how the room sounds. We'll, we'll get into that a little more. And, and this is clearly in the black magic territory. Um, but Russ will debate that. Um, um, but it's not just what the acquisitions want. Um, the, the, the theater planners also have you know, their concerns and their goals. Um, the notion of intimacy, that you know, you're really part of the performance, that you have connection with the actors on the stage. Um, focus, um, warmth, um, excitement, anticipation. I couldn't decide whether Ketchup or Carly Simon was better here, and then you have you know, the, the concept of delight as well. Um, one of the key things that um, the theater planners do, um, by, by no means the only thing, is to help figure out the basic layout of the room. Um, how many tiers, how many seats, how does it respond to price points of tickets, how does it move everybody close to the stage with the 
the viewpoints, focus points are, all that kind of stuff. And, and what you see here are basically three schemes overlapped. And, you know, if you push the row further back, the rank of the seats can be relaxed, but at the same time, you're, you're further away from the stage. So it's kind of like designing the hull of a boat. You can't do anything, change anything, without it changing another performance um, characteristic of, of what you're doing. And we'll get into how this applies to our design of Nashville as well. Um, here's my little esoteric analogy that I like to make, which is the designing of performing arts halls are similar to the designing of Gothic cathedrals, um, in that everything in a Gothic cathedral is about the proper light for meditation. In 10th century France, you began to start getting some of the elements of um, Gothicism, some pointed arches and assorted stuff, but there was real no Gothic style until Abbot Suger in 1011 issued his treatise on the proper light of meditation, and the next three or four centuries, everybody went about trying to get the largest stained glass windows possible, and everything we know in terms of the fan vaulting, the flying buttresses, the soaring height of the room, even the you know sculpture on the portals, how it you know steps out as it gets further away, is all about light. And in designing these rooms, it really is all about sound and everything you do. And we're about to get into this in more detail. This is a model section and photograph of the sidewall at the Skirmerhorn. And every surface you see here is serving a very specific purpose for acoustics, for theater technology, um, variable acoustics, structure, everything integrated together. And our goal, and this is not necessarily the goal of everybody who works on these types of buildings, but it should be, is to have the acoustics, theater technology, and architecture to be one and the same. Nobody wants a room that looks like it was designed by an acoustician and the architect put a bunch of pastiche in it and picked the colors. Um, nobody wants a room that is a grand architectural statement that then gets plastered with acoustic control devices and reflectors and whatever. Um, it, it really is to make all this stuff one and the same. And as I say, if it doesn't sound good and you get into the dispute, the acoustician will win. Um, so here's our case study. Um, one of the first things we did was we went on a mostly European venue tour with a large part of the stakeholders, client groups, people who had to help raise the money, um, etc. Visited a lot of great halls. The, the upper left is the um, music for Reinsall that the diagrams earlier were. Um, this is a classic shoebox concert hall. And it, there was a decision that that is where we would go with this. Um, there is, this is um, the Concert Battle in Amsterdam. Note the amount of seating behind the concert platform around the organ case. Um, that became a goal of our project as well. Uh, we went to the Berlin Philharmonie in um, Berlin, obviously. Um, where the great Berlin Philharmonic plays, and we did that as a counterpoint to, to make sure our client group knew that there are other solutions than a classic shoebox hall. Um, the thing I like most about this project is it shows just how um, Frank Gehry was not, you know, cutting Disney from whole cloth that had been done in the 60s. Um, and a lot of these rooms also have natural light, which played into our design planning as well. Um, the other thing is we looked at the, the great architecture of Nashville. Nashville is known as the Athens of the South, and it is not because they have the only um, full-size um, replica of the Parthenon, um, but it's because they have a lot of institutions of higher learning. But it does have a very rich neoclassical um, design basis. Sorry for this slide's a little fuzzy, but our um, site is this great out site here. It was across from a brand new kind of horrible park and three very large scale aggressively modern 
um, buildings, everybody thought that we should have the front door of this building face that park. Um, but we decided, after much debate, that the ceremonial front of this building would face an alley that one block away is Lower Broadway, the kind of hub of country music, honky tonks, and pedestrian activity in downtown Nashville. Um, the park had a parking garage entry immediately on this side, so we didn't think the ceremonial front should face that. We instead um, did a garden, sort of a garden facing the park, which ended up working really well. Um, in plan, you can see that we have our classic shoebox-shaped auditorium, different levels. We actually have entries on three sides of the building. And this is what it looks like from various sides. Um, the, the left is that main ceremonial front. You go up half flight stairs to a um, pedimented portico. Um, the upper right is that um, colonnade with the garden behind it across from the park. And the street on the back of it was an important street, but not an entry point, but we still gave it an important rather than the back facade. Um, some details. Um, moving inside, th this is sort of a grade level corner entries that most people use and the stairs that get you up there. We, we basically took the aesthetics of the outside and further stylized them as we moved into the building. Um, one of the things we loved about the Church Bow in Amsterdam was the minute you leave the room, there's a great public space as opposed to one giant lobby kind of in the front. And so we emulated that in, in what we did here. So what you're seeing are pieces of the north lobby, the east lobby, and the west lobby. Um, and now the room, um, named after one of the donor's mothers. So um, you can see we've got this shoebox shape. Um, it's laid out on a... Um, Orchestra, a raked orchestra floor, a raised parterre around that, a box tear along the sides above that with what was called a dress circle, even though it wasn't curved in the rear of the room, and then a balcony level with side boxes as well. Um, on the lower slide, you, you see how that works in section, and the organ facade in the back of the room. Um, and that's what it looks like from both entering the room towards the concert platform and from the concert platform looking at the rest of the room. I, I mentioned how integrated everything is and one of the things we learned from our acoustician is that it's really important to have somewhat repetitive wall shaping on the side walls somewhere in the range of 12 feet minimum, 18 feet, 20 feet maximum, sticking out a foot, foot and a half, something in that range. But you know, rather than some acousticians who tell you exactly what they want the size of the room is, Russ and his partners tell you the theory behind it and what they're trying to achieve and allow you to come up with a way to make this work. And so we ended up with a 19 foot structural grid and subdivided that into a nine and a half foot um, spacing, so we have major and minor pilasters, the windows fit in that grid, the structure fits in that grid, um, the variable acoustics that will get in sort of work within that grid, um, everything blends and works together and is very well integrated. And even though this room has a high degree of detail for a performance hall, that detail is part of how the room behaves that the, the large pilasters are what helps reflect and diffuse the bass sounds. The steps in the walls, the recessed doors, stuff like that are working in the mid frequencies. And we have a bas relief on the parapet fronts that tell the life and times of Laura Turner that help reflect those really high frequency notes and, and diffuse them. Going back to what I said about how everything works differently at different frequencies. Um, I'll jump in. the. The repetitive element is creating individual arrivals and almost like a waterfall to the sound. 
And so that's a really fundamental acoustic property we were trying to get, and as Greg described, he implemented it very well. Um, the same thing, you know, you see in plan, this is the box tier where we've got our um, two-level um, boxes, and then you see all that shaping sort of in the middle of the drawing, horizontally, along the walls, and then into the anterooms that the boxes have, which serve as the sound and light box, which is another key part of achieving that silence that we talked about earlier. Um, and then it, it also works in section, and that you, you see um, the acoustic isolation pieces here. You, we'll look at this in a little more detail, but you've got all the pockets and stuff that store the um, variable acoustics, a um, lot of cable and um, chases, etc., for Bob's rigging that makes the variable acoustics go up and down and do what it's supposed to do. Um, again, this is not just a sidewall, it's a whole volume, and how the ceiling works is every bit as important as the sidewalls, and it, it's the same thing, that, that the large ceiling expense is broken up with coffer beams and coffers and smaller detail and elements of different sizes. One of the things I want to point out is this little thing here. Um, the building, um, as one of its decorative motifs, works on irises, so we had a little play on words and used a camera iris to decorate what is otherwise a hole in the ceiling that Bob used for pick points that allow us to do a greater degree of production events when necessary by just dropping lines through those irises. You can also see how the um, lighting instruments, the technical lighting instruments were specced as white rather than black and they fit into little dog houses and they're always on the upstate side of the major coffer beam so that when you're entering the room their appearance is minimized. So again, you know, Bob's company is responsible for the technical lighting as well as sight lines and other things, and it's, it's integrating what Russ needs, what Bob needs, and what we want it to look like. Yeah. I, I said you know, earlier I went over Russ's goals and Bob's goals. Our goal is pretty. You know, that's, <laughs> we, we just try and make it look good. Or at least that's what David Trojan said. Um, and then you, you can see in the, the ceiling section here how all those um, coffer beams and other minor articulation works, and then two slides of all of the junk that Bob has above the ceiling. And there are dog houses, there's lift lines for speaker clusters, there's all kinds of stuff in there, there's winches. Um, it is the proverbial 10 pounds of you know what trying to go into a five pound bag. Um, the concert platform is one of the most important design elements because it's what everybody is looking at, but it's also where the musicians are playing. And they have to be able to hear themselves and they have to be able to hear each other. Um, I'm sure you've all been in modern halls that have the Starship Enterprise or some version of it hanging above the stage um, for reflections. None of the halls in, in Europe, the classic ones um, from the 18th, 19th century, had those, so we didn't want one. Um, we, we told Russ and his partner Paul that and got minor pushback, but they said they would study it. And in the end, things like having the ceiling over the concert platform lower, extending the side balconies all the way across to the back of the room or front of the room, in this case may be, to get reflections back onto the stage, um, the diffuse surfaces of the organ, um, the grill work on the core terrace wall, etc. All that stuff helped create an environment where they felt comfortable that the performers were going to be able to hear each other um, and themselves. Um, variable acoustics, we talked about it earlier, but here's some details. Um, when you, all rooms today have to have multiple uses. Um, when it is in the non-amplified, pure symphonic mode, you want everything to be hard to get those reflections. But if you did that when you do amplified events, all you would hear is garble and no speech intelligibility and everything. So you have to deaden the room. 
We did this with a series of panels that popped out from below the park here on the lower level, on the box here because of all the doors into the anterooms we didn't really do anything. Then on the um, side boxes from the balcony level we have um, banners that pop up from a wainscot pocket and then on the upper level where we have the windows we both have um, blackout shades and, and glare control shades that come down from the ceiling but we also have um, acoustic banners that come up from pockets in that entablature and they can be set either all up, all down, half up, whatever but from an architectural standpoint, none of that stuff is covering the pilasters and stuff like that. So we still have the basic lead of the room, the articulation is present, um, even if it's in the deadened um, amplified mode. It, it, it's also used for uh, orchestra rehearsal when there's no audience in the room. Yeah, the, the, the audience is actually the most absorptive thing in the room. And when you rehearse, if there's no audience, you're not getting the same acoustic environment as when you're performing. Um, natural light was another thing we really wanted to do, and another thing we did a little bit of arm wrestling and dark games and pool games, trying to see who would win. Um, and in the end, we ended up with three inches of laminate glass on the outside, a 25-inch airspace, and another two inches on an inner light. Um, our project manager from the National Based Architect Record let off a shotgun blast right here on the outside and Russ on the inside heard a... So um, it worked for Russ. Um, I'm a little disappointed. I think that the 25 inch airspace and how you get that parallax between the inner and outer muttons and stuff like that wasn't quite as successful in terms of, you know, natural light into the room as we would have liked, but there was at a, least we got it. Well, there was a very specific requirement from the client, and that is that when they have a, a guest artist to come in and record, Yo-Yo Ma or whoever with the symphony, and if there were thunderstorms in the area, they didn't want to have that noise inside the room because it would be cancel the recording session. And so, of course, if lightning struck the building, that's a whole other situation, but that was essentially the, the, the criteria, is that if there was a thunderstorm within a mile of Nashville, or a bad architect with a shotgun, or, or somebody with a shotgun on the roof, we, we, we don't want to hear that. So, okay. um, I think this is last or next to last here, and then we'll get into our panel discussion. But we were three quarters of the way through um, schematic design and the client came to us and said, I really want a convertible floor with rake seating for classical concerts and a flat floor for ballroom and cabaret pops and assorted stuff. Debutante balls. As, yeah, debutante balls, weddings, and rental income, etc. Um, uh, most of the halls we saw in Europe had flat floors and effectively indexed folding chairs, which would never work for a U.S. audience. Um, but he was enamored with the notion of being able to clear out the floor. So what we ended up with, mostly Bob's work, is a convertible floor that can go from one mode you see on the left to the mode you see on the right at this point in less than an hour. Um, this has been, had been done in smaller little recital halls and stuff like that. But this is the first time that anybody has pulled this off in a major, you know, 1850 seat concert hall. Um, the left is your diagram of how that works. Um, the seats are in place. They can go on the pit elevator here to a garage in the basement. And then they store in the basement in kind of the opposite order of how they play up here. Um, here you see them, a couple of these chair wagons which go from parquet to parquet stored in the um, garage. Here you see a section of chair wagons being rolled onto the left ready to come up and here you see the room where only the um, downstage wagon or two are in place. So that gives you some idea of 
how that works, and um, it really was a ingenious solution. Um, um, warm colors are generally thought to make the room sound warm. And our client's favorite color was celadon green, hardly what you would call warm. But with the use of a um, raspberry mohair on the seats and a lot of African macaray wood on the concert platform, we were able to warm things up enough for um, the acousticians to be satisfied here. And the slide on the right is Maestro um, Guerrera um, conducting, and the orchestra plays on risers that Russ and Paul designed. Um, and by elevating each of the desks as you get further away from the conductor, it helps make sure that people can actually see the full orchestra from their seats. And if you can see everybody, it really helps with your perception of localization and where the different sounds are coming from. And with that, we're going to move into the panel discussion. A little history of Nashville there. Don't you love shooting the shotgun to test the sound, the noise isolation, make sure the room's quiet? Um, Craig, you described Scrummer Horn as a shoebox concert hall. Can you tell us, each of you, a little bit how the program of uses dictates the design of the room? I'll start on this end. Um, uh, what the case study that we're looking at um, specifically is a concert hall. And as a computer planner, we our, our, our breadth of depth of uh, what we do is not just concert halls. It's also performing arts centers for multi uses. As, as um, Craig showed, Bass Hall is for not only the symphony but the ballet and the opera also are performing there. But again, it opened the phantom of the opera, and that's what tends to make money for these institutions. Um, so. Uh, when we're working with the concert hall, um, it's a very specific use space. So there are things about the hall, especially the acoustics, that drive what that design is. It's not always the best design for the kind of uh, characteristics that a theater planner would want, such as Craig put up for, like for example, intimacy. When you have a shoebox hall, you're constrained by the width of the room, which means if you're trying to get in more than 16 or 1800 seats, the room tends to get longer and folks tend to get farther from the stage. Um, those of you who are familiar with Shakespeare, uh, the Harmon Center downtown that we worked on, that is very specific to theater. And theater is very important to see the expressions on actors' faces, so that design, that particular design, try to get 750 seats in the room. You try to get those folks as close to the stage as possible and to eliminate the need for amplified voice and to ex get the expressions of the face out. So, Particular to what the needs of the room are, help inform what we as planners need to do for the design of the room. I, th I think in the case of Nashville, in particular, um, in terms of program being a classical music venue, one of the first questions that came to us was, well, is it going to be as loud as and impactful as the country music that you hear in Nashville. And so, in thinking about this room and, and looking at the basic uh, uh, initial design in terms of width and volume and the decision uh, with respect to the shoebox, we really took that, that question and comment very seriously. That the, the orchestral experience, and I think this is becoming more and more common today as we all listen to, to sound on our iPad uh, iPods and iPads, that the, this, this visceral impact and sonic impact, I think that was one of your slides, Craig, uh, really, really drove uh, the, the program and the acoustic program uh, of this particular hall. Yeah, um, one of the things, the, the Nashville Symphony was a great client, and oftentimes money dictates everything, and they'll say, oh, we absolutely need you know, 2,000 seats because that's what our business pro forma says. Um, 
our client came to us and said, we want somewhere around you know, 1,900 seats, plus or minus, but we're not going to let the seat count dictate the quality of the room. And if you need to make the room a little smaller or if you're able to make the room a little bigger, fine. We just want it to sound great. And that's unusual. Um, but that was very good. One of the, um, one of the um, successes of Nashville was very early, um, um, I think just after programming, we had a big kind of charrette and had everybody in a room, had a great meal, and then um, David and Craig, I think, organized a, a, a kind of a session where we put a big sheet of, on an on a easel and said, what are the goals of the project? What are the most important things to get in this project? Because we're going to go back to these goals every time there's a major decision or every time Russ and Bob are fighting with each other. So um, the first thing that was, and, and this was all the stakeholders, um, uh, musicians, there were musicians representation, uh, represented, as well as the staff of the, of the hall. And number one was, of course, acoustics. <coughs> number two was acoustics, and I think three <laughs> was acoustics. Four, I believe, was that um, Martha wanted a 300-year building right. that, that, that she knew that would last. In other words, nothing, and Craig can talk more about 300. And then down the line was, you know, seat count, cost, and other implications. But, but having set that goal, that meant, as Craig said before, for this particular building, when it came down to what drove a design decision, or from my point of view, a theater planning decision, or a cost decision, acoustics tend to win, and, and that's and that's not always the case, even with uh, you know uh, the performing arts projects that we work. And, and to have a client that at every at the end of every building committee meeting, after we went through all the different things that we were talking about, that was always the last question: um, Did we do anything today or make any decisions that would compromise the acoustics of the space? And we would have to answer, uh, you know, no. So, Bob, you mentioned that one of the goals was to keep you and Russ from, from fighting with each other, and maybe we should have separated you this morning, but um, there are firms out there in the industry who offer both acoustic and theater planning services. What are the pros and cons of that arrangement versus having individual firms? I, I, I can speak to the, uh, to the pros of having three separate firms. Um, we've always talked about the three-legged stool, the anomaly is really it's the four-legged stool in order to move a project forward and to have um, really successful design meetings and goal meetings. And it, that's in, for pro performing arts specific projects, which is to have the theater planner um, and the acoustician and the architect as three separate companies or three separate entities that all provide um, their own characteristics, their parameters, their things that drive the quality of, of everything about the design of the building <coughs> and the room. Um, the fourth one is, of course, the owner. They have to be part of that. They're the decision maker. And when you have a company that has um, particularly, uh, there are some companies that actually have architecture, acoustics, and theater planning, it's all part of one company. The owner doesn't get to participate in the decisions between one thing over the next. So. Um, I've heard it explained by such firms as though it says, we keep all that arguing in the back room. We make those decisions so the owner doesn't have to be faced with having to deal with whether or not they, they have 100 theater lights over the stage or an extra second of reverberation time. You know, those, you know, those kinds of decisions. Counter to that, though, is the owner should be part of that. The owner needs to be part of that because it's ultimately their building. It's not the architect's building, it's not my building, and it's not Russell's building. It's also a question from the architect's perspective of checks and balances between the key components of the design. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson and friends were smart enough to know, you know, when they wrote the Constitution that we were going to have an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch for, to keep the balance of power. And he's smarter than anybody in this room, so you know why should we undo that? But um, you know, I don't want to get outvoted by a um, acoustician and theater planner who are working for the same firm. I, I want it to be 
you know, a collaboration and know that, you know, you, you form alliances, you, you get, you know, one person to agree and then everybody agrees. And, and just that whole balance of how you work goes out the window um, when the, these two guys become one. And there's, there can be an exciting moments, I think, Bob would nail it, that if the client is part of that, we, the canopy dis discussion, uh, we had a, we created a full uh, a 20 scale model of the room and we were doing our acoustic testing. Uh, the final test, we had not finished that. It was, we were still in the process and we had the whole team come down and the, the owner. And we all made that determination with that test all at the same time. And that was an exciting moment for the project. So, Skirm Horn was the third collaboration among um, principals from these three firms, but presumably, Bob and Russ, you've both worked with architects who probably haven't done a hall before or haven't worked with your firms before. So when you encounter a new architect, what are the most important things you think for them to learn going into the project? Well, I, I think Craig really spoke to the way we, we try to approach it with, with architects, and I think that architects that, that we can work with in this way create buildings like this. Uh, and that is, um, instead of the acquisition uh, coming in and adding elements later, or um, uh, the acquisition starting first and then the architect trying to make something, it, it's, it's where we can sit down with an architect lay out the parameters, really discuss what we're trying to do uh, acoustically. Not, not specify a product or um, a particular shape for that matter, but really grasp the, 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 pro the, the room holistically, then take that and evolve the architecture from that. And I will say that Craig is, and, and David are, are one of the best firms uh, in, in that regard and it, it, it makes us joy, it, it, it gives us great joy to be able to do that. And anybody that I would want to work with uh, at the outset, that would be the first thing that I would, I would look for. I, I think that um, what we try to do at the outset of the project is to get um, the architect and anybody on the project who's never worked on that type of performance venue to be more involved about, and understand what the priorities of the venue are and maybe spend a week with that um, organization because it's not just about the performance on the stage, but it's also access to loading, how you, people get into the building, um, how people use the building for non-performance related issues, uh, how they rent the lobby out for, again, receptions and banquets and stuff. So understanding the priorities of the user and the owner of the building is very critical so that when we're down into design development and CDs and we're making decisions, we can say, yeah, we need that that catering pantry to be accessible backstage in the front of house because it's serving both. So the more they understand about the project and what the needs are, the more easier it is to make those, those decisions down the road. So Craig, what were some of the steps you took, particularly in Nashville, to really understand the client, their goals, their needs? Um, I um, pursued this job for quite a while and actually was able to um, have many opportunities to meet with Alan Valentine, their CEO and, and president, the kind of non-artistic um, lead of the symphony. And the Nashville Symphony, when we started this project, was kind of a little blip on the radar screen in the symphony orchestra world. But, but Alan knew he had a quality product and wanted to use this building to um, increase the quality of that product um, and to put it on more stable um, financial grounds. Um, in, in doing so, increase the number of people coming through, um, attract a younger audience, which is key to um, survival of symphonies at this point. And, and we, we just had lots of really good conversations. I, I got to meet the major donors early on before there ever was a selection process. Um, and um, 
you know, having gone through the process before with the Cleveland Orchestra, another quality orchestra, um, you know, it was a little easier than it might otherwise have been. And I, I can tell you, having moved from PPAC, which was a multi-purpose, huge room without a decent concert shell, into this room, you know, a year later, um, the quality of the symphony and their playing and being able to rehearse in their own room and, and hear themselves and everything is just amazing. Um, and the guest artist that they get to come to Nashville is, you know, astounding um, because everybody wants to play in this room and everybody wants to play with this orchestra. TPAC, for those of you who don't know, is the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, which was sort of your basic <coughs> civic arts center um, in Nashville. So going back inside the room here, what was it that led Alan to believe he wanted this convertible floor? Was there a precedent that he'd seen? Money. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and it's working out for them, because for those of you who don't know, there's a show on ABC called Nashville, and they've shot at least five episodes in this hall. Um, including last the one that aired last night, actually, yeah. So, so it's on TV quite frequently. Um, so, Bob, from your perspective, what did that mean to you guys? Had you guys completed convertible floors before? No, well, the, the history of, of how it happened was um, we had, uh, as Craig pointed out, um, that some of the models for the public spaces were Amsterdam and, and Berlin, I think, and uh, not the concert hall, but um, but um, were to have rather than one large lobby, um, which uh, the Meyerson Concert Hall in Texas has one of the larger lobbies, was to have uh, smaller rooms that were off of each side, the east side, the west side, and the north side of the hall. Um, because we did that, we broke down any possibility of doing a large um, event that could generate other income or outside revenue. And a lot of these halls, when they're dark, um, can raise that revenue by um, putting receptions, balls, and, and, um, and whatnot in the lobbies. So uh, Ted Didi, who is the operations <coughs> folk, um, manager at the time, said, well, how can we generate this income? And so um, we did a study um, examining actually three ways to take all eight, these are about 800 seats on the main floor, to take them out of the room and in, in, in as little time as possible. And um, we've, we've done a few, but not at the scale. And the, the technology it can be very, very expensive. We're now doing it also in the, the Tobin Center in San Antonio, um, where each individual row of seats can be flipped over and uh, a flat floor can be um, exchanged that way. But the criteria for this was to have, when these seats went away, a nice, beautiful finished floor for the rental events instead of, and as you can see, Craig, has designed a, this beautiful herringbone pattern wood floor. Um, we didn't want air diffusers in it. We didn't want slots in it. We didn't want guides for these large wagons. Um, there are in there, but they're concealed into the, the design of the floor. Um, so what we found was the cost of it was, um, I can't remember the total cost for it, about $4 million, $3.9, million, um, that was added again during DD, early DD. But um, very important to the hall was they wanted not more than three or four folks to be able to take the wagons out of the room in less than an hour. And that was the most important thing. So they could set up for a concert event in the afternoon, take them out and do a rental event in the, in the, uh, in the evening. And union stagehands drive lots of design decisions. And you know, th th this one is a concert hall, but when you do a multi-purpose room that needs a orchestra shell set up on the stage, the number of people it takes to move all the pieces and get that done is an important part of the design criteria. And that's how we had a great design solution that we couldn't execute because it just took too many people. Um, we ended up with another great design solution. But, you know, money drives everything. And the um, $4 million number, which included creating the space for the you know, garage below to park everything. Um, if you looked at that in terms of endowment and the return on investment that the endowment would generate versus doing this convertible floor and the ancillary income that the ballroom space generates, it was 
a no-brainer, although from this project we call that intuitively obvious because our building committee chair, sometimes when we said no-brainer and he had to think about it, thought maybe we were calling him stupid. So. <laughs> so, Russ, when you heard about this design change, did you have any concerns about what that would do to the acoustics? Well, first I want to say before, for the opening night uh, gala, we had the or orchestral concert. We all cleared the building, had dinner, came back in and had a ballroom dance. And it was a great evening. But yes, when we first uh, when we first heard about this, I think it's important to understand most people think uh, when you think of acoustics and music, even musicians all the time, they say wood is good. But in fact, if you look at the great concert halls, uh, Vienna, the Concert Cabal, most all of those rooms are plastered directly on uh, a masonry backing. Very heavy, massive uh, surfaces that contain, in particular, the low frequency sound in a room. And it's very important for the bass, basses and the, 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 the cello and, and the orchestra. Most concert halls will either have, um, for the audience, flooring will be a concrete floor or a floor directly on a solid substrate. So as soon as you take a floor surface that is no longer grounded in a heavy material, this could have been a huge bass trap or element that would absorb that bass energy. So in fact, one of the key design criteria for the, this convertible floor now was that it had to have a, a similar acoustic mass as to the rest of the surfaces. For example, the ceiling in the hall is concrete with plaster, about eight inches, eight, eight or 12 yeah. inches. The walls are 12 inches of concrete with plaster directly on it. So the criteria that we came up with uh, for the floor was about two inches of wood with a quarter inch steel plate. Comes out to about a little over 20 pounds per square foot. And by doing that, we were able to, to retain that low frequency uh, bass energy that uh, is so desirable. And of course, that gave Bob a, a challenge by doing many emails. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> the tallest, largest wagons in the downstage end of the room are in the neighborhood of you know, 30,000 pounds. So, you know, a lot, lot of weight to try and move across a parquet floor. And, and we've maintained that criteria because this works so well on the, the other project that, that Bob just mentioned. Uh, this is now kind of our standard. And I think it's the first time it's been done. Craig, how did this affect your design uh, intentions for the room? Well, yeah, as I said, this was sprung on us about three quarters of the way through schematic design and, and without any schedule change. And we all said, no way, no how, you know, whatever. But you know, here it is, and I think you know I liken this sort of to what I was saying about the variable acoustics that we wanted the room to basically read the same, whether it was in the symphonic or the amplified mode, and you know it's the same thing. We wanted the same degree of elegance. We want the same beauty. We want the same articulation of the spaces, um, whether the cheer wagons were in place or, or whether we had a flat floor. Um, you know, fortunately, we were able to do this parquet floor. Um, we sort of took the coffering system from the ceiling and projected it down on the floor to, to lay out the major elements, the little endowments in the center. Um, the, you, you could sort of make it out on the lower mm -hmm. level side mm -hmm. walls, but the parquet walls have the same degree of articulation in terms of the rhythm of stasis and pilasters as the stuff above, so we're trying to keep um, the same you know, look. And what we actually have between those pilasters is a um, decorative architectural grill, which is, um, th those are the return air plenums. And when in the ballroom, they're sucking air directly from the room, and when the chair wagons are in place, they're sucking air from under the chairs, and then behind each row of chairs, there's um, grills on the floor. So, um, you know, it works um, HVAC-wise, it's all integrated as well. 
Um, we, we could do another three-hour lecture the one time to do HVAC systems for Why? performance <laughs> calls because you're moving vast quantities of air very, very slowly, which anybody with any knowledge of HVAC knows that means huge cross-sections of ducts. But yeah, I think we, we achieved a room that basically reads the same regardless of whether it's in the flat or the right configuration. And that was our goal. So whereas the floor was kind of a challenge for everybody, it was something that was very important to the clients. So everyone worked together to make it happen. It seems like the windows, however, were a little bit more of a debate. Um, what exactly was the debate about including the, the clear story windows, which is a very unusual feature in a concert hall, and particularly a concert hall in the US, and how was that debate resolved? Well, this was a um, desire of David Schwartz to have these windows. Um, th this was our first opportunity at a concert hall that was new purpose built. And you know, when you look at those rooms we visited in Europe, a lot of them have windows. David was talking about the windows um, before we even went to Europe. Um, a couple events happened while we were in Europe. One, we were in the Tannhalle in Zurich, and their windows were closed, um, blacked out when we were first in the room, and everything just felt really dark and dingy, and they opened them for us, and you could just really see the difference between um, them. But the other, even more enlightening, pun intended, um, experience was at the Music Rhine Hall, where we went to a late afternoon matinee on a Sunday, and it was Dvorak's Requiem, I believe, and in the last movement, in the final um, crescendo, um, the sun had moved around to the west side of the building and came streaming in the third story windows, bouncing off all of the gold-leafed caryatids, and it was like a, a magic moment, and that's when the whole group was keen on having the windows. Um, it was still up to Russ to deal with the recording criteria of the room, and you know, in the end, you know, it was a compromise that we 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 kind of knew that that depth between the inner and outer lights was going to not be aesthetically ideal, but you know, some natural light was better than none, so we compromised. Yeah, and I think I think we've already talked about the, the, the criteria here versus the, the 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 older halls when they were built they didn't have the same criteria. There may have been some additional glazing put in, but um, in, in some of the halls in Europe you do hear some of the traffic noise and activity. Um, but the criteria here was so high for the recording uh, aspect that it, it demanded the, the solution. Yeah, I'll, I'll diverge a little bit, but when we did Severance Hall, that was a um, 1929 to 330 beautiful love landmark. Um, they had single glazing, they had um, glass doors from the outside to the lobby and from the lobby into the auditorium and a hospital a couple blocks away. Um, they have a zero tolerance for any noise they can control and a 100% tolerance for any noise they can't control. So if the ambulance goes by on the street, too bad. But if it's a mechanical noise in the room, um, once every six months, they in the early morning, they turn off every single electrical and mechanical system and switch them on one by one as they have six key staff listening in the room. And if they hear anything come on, they feel infiltration, the, the noise coefficient that you design for is all part of the equation, and it's in part of the equation that can suck up your budget quickly. If you establish a criteria that is more um, stringent than you need, you're throwing money away. So, um, on that point, um, Russ, one of your partners says that the magic of a performance is in the crescendos. And the mystery is in the silence. So how do you as the acoustician make sure that both of those are equally as clear and as powerful? Um, well, I think the, 
the, the magic is, is, is at that threshold of, of silence. And that's, as Craig just described, that's really one of the most difficult things to achieve. And both, both just from a, a, a mass construction, uh, this building in particular is a building within a building. The hall is actually completely isolated from the rest of the building, all the mechanical systems, kitchens, with an acoustic, set the two inch acoustic isolation joint. So in, in creating that kind of construction, uh, not only is it uh, an added cost, but a, a lot of added attention to detail, both uh, in, in, in Craig's creating the, the, the detailed drawings, but also uh, during construction. So a lot, of, a lot of effort goes into that. And this, the, the, uh, the recording engineer from Boston came in and did some of the early uh, recordings uh, with the skimmer And he said most halls, his little needle on his VU meter, you know, they, they kind of wiggle just a little bit down at the bottom. His, his, meter, his, his meter for his recording sessions in Nashville, was, the, the needle was over here at zero, perfectly still. He's getting, when, when the orchestra was not playing. So that, that's a tough achievement to, to happen. Secondly, in terms of, of acoustic power, uh, a really interesting thing happened. We, we had the uh, musicians over at TPAC where they, where they had been playing, and they, um, the brass would, would put shields in front of them to protect the other musicians. And that becomes a, a detractor for sound out into the audience, but it was really a protective measure because their experience on stage was not good, it was so loud, the musicians sitting right in front. And we had a whole discussion, we, we taped out the orchestra and tried to describe to them the new condition in the, in the new hall, and they really didn't believe me at the beginning. I said, you're not going to need those shields when you, when you move to your new room. Well, no, no, we got to have them. Well, in fact, when they moved from TPAC over to the Nashville stage, because they were in this larger acoustic envelope and volume, the energy can now bloom and dissipate. And so it's not only helpful for what the audience is hearing, but with this reduction in sound energy on stage, the musicians are now able to hear the room and they're able to hear across the stage. And guess what? The shields came down. Mm -hmm. So uh, a concert hall not only has to be able to go to the edge of silence, but also has to allow that, that energy of that orchestra to, to bloom uh, in the space. And the National Symphony has actually since won a Grammy for something that was recorded in this room. Several. 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 Yeah. Um, so it sounds like on this project you had clients who had a pretty clear understanding of their goals, were, were pretty in tune with the types of things they wanted from the room in particular. I would imagine, however, that's not always the case. Are there any things that each of your firm does in the early stages of meeting with a client to help them understand the process of building a new hall? A lot of them, you know, if you have a developer client, they've probably built dozens of these before, but with a, an institutional client, they generally have not. Well, there's probably as many different client groups for these buildings as there are these buildings, in that, you know, this building was owned by, built by, fundraised for the user, the, the symphony. Um, there are ones where you have a nonprofit running the facility with numerous um, resident companies. There are others that are government-owned facilities. Um, some are purely government, some are public-private partnership, some have resident companies, some have you know, a prayer of you build it and they will come. You know, it's it's you're starting out with different groups with different amount of knowledge. Different, you know, are we satisfying one resident company who also owns it, or you know, has it got to be you know work for everybody? And you know, a lot of that just shakes out in the programming of the building, which oftentimes is done with the theater planner working with a um, kind of arts strategic planner um, way before they ever select the acoustician and the architect. Um, sometimes you know, we're involved. Um, we're always involved in kind of the program um, verification and fleshing out the detail stage 
Um, we also do visioning sessions, which I think is what Bob was talking about earlier, where we give them a list of 100 questions and say we don't need the answers to all these in a day, but we're trying to, you know, just what do they want out of this building? And, you know, simply saying we want to, you know, one time, one budget, and um, world class with perfect acoustics isn't an acceptable answer because everybody wants that and there's no um, detail there to work with. Um, what was interesting, and, and, and you guys probably all know this because you're most of you are architects, I assume, but you know, you, you can have quality expectation, you can have budget, you can have programming, you can have schedule in, in a project. But you have to put those in some sort of order because you can never achieve all four perfectly. And, and we asked them that question in the first visiting session, you know, and our main lead donor, who was chairman of the board of the symphony at the time, sweetly simply said, well, I guess I would have to say that um, the schedule is the least important because we know you're going to finish on time and everything else. <laughs> And, and we did. We this building opened on the exact weekend, four and a half years after our first kickoff meeting that it was planned to open. Okay, so psychoacoustics is is that really a thing, and does it have regional implications? Well, I, I you know we talked about the the loudness in Nashville, and um, I, I think, and, and I want to touch on one one thing about. This, that kind of ties into all this, and that is, we started out by saying, well, we want perfect acoustics. Well, what we like to do with a client is to refine that and to develop a language about talking about acoustics, because there's different flavors of concert hall acoustics. There's rooms that are more articulate. There are rooms that are more rich and resonant, and so by having those discussions with the client and hearing during the tour these different spaces, we developed a language to be able to describe the sound that they are looking for. And by, by doing that, we can then translate that uh, into architecture. And going back to the psychoacoustics, ultimately, it's, it's an experience. It's an immersive experience. Well, the sound in a great concert hall uh, should envelop you, it should, should hit you and, and, and wrap around you. And to support that experience, you need to be prepared for it. And to be prepared for it, the space, your entrance into that space from the city, you need to decompress. You need to, 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 to put the city, the, the, the hustle and bustle aside. And, and, for example, in, our, in the lobbies, the beautiful lobbies that Craig designed, uh, there's uh, acoustical plaster up in the ceiling to control the, the noise. So when you have two or three hundred people or, or five hundred people in a, in, a, in, a, in a lobby, they're not in an environment that's already harsh. Um, they're now in an environment that is, is quiet and they're transitioning uh, into the concert hall. Now, once they get into that concert hall, and I think Vienna was the inspiration, and I think this room completely does this, you feel like when, when you walk in and when you sit down, you're now in a special place. And if you're in a special place, you're going to already be predisposed to hear something that is, is going to be special. And I think that aspect of, of psychoacoustics, in terms of what what the architecture can bring to your immersive experience uh, it, it is so important. So that's why we love credit. <laughs> so, so I actually have a question on Russ because you're talking about you know how do you decide whether this is going to be a sort of articulate hall versus a rich hall or somewhere in between. And do you talk to your current music director? We, we did the ballpark in Arlington for the Texas Rangers. And you know, the question is, do you design a ballpark for your current pitching staff and sluggers? Or do you realize that they're all going to, if they're any good, be bought by the Yankees? So we yeah. do something more um, you know, universal. How, how, do you deal, how do you deal with that? How do you, you know, when, when we work on um, 
severance together, it was very clear that the existing hall, as dry and precise as it was, was responsible for the great Cleveland sound, and the goal was do not change the acoustics, just enhance them. Um, how, how do you, well, and when you've got a blank cloth, how do you figure out what the right well, way to do it? And, and I, think, I think it's very true that in designing a new room, you're actually creating uh, the sound of the orchestra. Uh, so, that, so that when the day this building opened, uh, that, that was not the sound of the Nashville Symphony. That was the beginning of their sound that they are today and, and, and are known for, in that the, their sound uh, evolves and adapts. They adjust. We, we spent three, three months uh, prior to the opening just, just so that the orchestra could begin to experience the space, respond to it, and feel the space to develop their sound. And in the day one, that was, that was the beginning of that, but it continues to evolve. So, in, in starting from scratch, the sound is not just the folks that you see here at the table. The sound uh, uh, is, is, is a combination of the architectural, acoustic, theater design, but also the musicians that now come into the space, and they react to it. And people compose music specifically for different spaces. And so, you know, a, a hall like this can affect the direction, um, and I'm not saying th this one, you know, this one does that, but the great halls in particular have, have created the classical music that, uh, that we all know and love today. So, you guys are saying you're waiting for your Grammys to arrive, right. too. Right, we're not getting it's It's just a historic example that um, when we work with, we work with many of these halls, renovations of halls like Severance, there is a Vienna sound, and everybody knows it when they talk about the sound of the Vienna Orchestra. There's a Berlin sound that's relatively new because the hall is from the uh, early 60s. There's a Chicago sound because the Chicago Symphony Orchestra has been playing in the Bern building since the early 1900s. And even the conductors that have conducted and the maestros that have taken over the reins for these organizations have been selected because of the particular sound of that orchestra. You'd never hire somebody that that would be the antithesis or trying to do something different. The interesting thing that happened in, the, in one of the more recent hall designs was uh, LA, the LA Philharmonic, didn't really have a specific sound until they moved into Disney. And now it's been, I think, a decade or more. Um, they have a, a fantastic young conductor who's now taking that direction, just as Nashville is creating their sound. They've begun that process as well. So. Being in a space for a matter of decades is what takes it for this this orchestra to develop their own sound. And at some point, they'll have it. Bob, we saw your sight lines chart earlier. I understand FDA is using some pretty <coughs> virtual technologies, technologies to help you guys understand those sight lines. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it's changing, or if it's changing your process? It, um, we, we always try to use what a, a available technology that we have at the time and um, using whatever platform. So, for example, a decade ago when um, we were starting to work in 3D CAD, or more than a decade ago, we were developing software so we can actually sit in the seat and look at the individual seats and see what the sight lines are for the stage. Now, we've, uh, now we have the Oculus Rift, which we saw in the lobby actually at the Marriott, where you can actually wear um, glasses. Um, and we're talking to Russ, but maybe there's a way that we can sense the sound of the room. But um, what's been very difficult for a theater designer is to try and describe how the sight lines work and looking at a, a 3D image on a two-dimensional uh, media, which is the only way we've been able to do it, um, is very difficult for someone to realize what they're looking at. So um, as in this room, just tipping your head just a little bit, you can see the entire table up here, but when you're sitting looking at a static image, even though it's three-dimensional, it's created from a 3D model, you look at it and you don't really get a sense of, you know, how close you are to the stage, you don't get the sense of the room, you don't get a sense of the people around you and how you can adjust where you're sitting. So we're now able to take the technology that we have now and, and um, show clients the, not only that you see the stage well, 
but to get a sense of the intimacy of the room, which is also quite important to the experience that you're sharing with an audience. I want to open it up to you guys right now. Does anybody in the audience have any questions for our panelists? Yes. Just, just wondering from a design standpoint, uh, I've always heard about these ratios for performing arts centers length, but with to keep the box format. And then I've lately seen some newer symphonies that are getting wider and wider and wider. Performing arts centers are getting wider and leaving the shoe boxes. Is there a certain size, I guess, that you start losing the, the, the length by width at least? Or well, the actual capacity, I guess, they're somewhere down the road. They've got to be too large. Aren't they? That's, there's several, <laughs> several questions there that you made and, and key points. Uh, first off, uh, the impact is um, directly related to the to the size of the, the room, and what's important is that in order to create a, a hall that supports the, the the resonance and the reverberation of the classical music, we have to create a reverberation time that, that's around two seconds. And in order to do that, the reverberation time is inversely proportional to the amount of absorption of the room. So the more people you put into a room, the more you dampen the sound, the lower the reverberation time. To compensate that for that, you have to make the volume, which is directly related, so as the volume goes up, the reverberation time goes up. Um, so the more people you add, the larger the volume. And what then happens is now you push the walls out and the ceilings out. And so the early reflections, the, the side reflections that you need for lateral spatial information, that um, gets degraded because now the sound attenuates because there's a further path to travel. So it's, it's first important to address the seat count. And in this particular uh, hall, we, we started out around what, 2,000, 2,100 uh, as a discussion point, but in talking with Alan, he said, no, we want this thing to be impactful. And we ended up around what? 1844. 1844. That's a great uh, size. For, for a while we were at 1904, which I remember because it's the last four yeah. digits of Russ's <laughs> number. But, <laughs> and for the first three digits. Yeah. And, and so, and so, and, and if, you, if you look at the old halls, they uh, are seated with different seating standards. So, 1800 seats today is a much larger audience absorptive area than 1,800 seats in the uh, early 1900s. So we have to make that adjustment when thinking about rooms. And then, you know, you're talking about new shapes and new forms. There are the, the, the Hall in Berlin that Craig showed. Uh, it, it's not a shoebox. It's a what we call a surround or vineyard style where the audience wraps around the orchestra. But there still has to be surfaces that replicate the, the lateral side reflections that Craig showed in his diagram from a shoebox design, that has to occur in, in, in those rooms as well. So like Meyerson and is it Meyerson in Dallas? Yeah. That, it, that, that's like what? About four thousand of it? No, it's, oh, no, it's, it's twenty one. I was gonna say it's around twenty one. Oh, I, mean, okay. I mean there's there's a couple things and you you're dealing with um, concert halls versus multi purpose rooms, theaters, opera houses, whatever, but if you're going to do Broadway, um, you need 2,500 seats for it to be phenomenally financially successful, viable. You need 2,100 seats kind of as a minimum, and if you're anywhere below 2,100 seats, then it takes some degree of um, donor sponsored subsidy to really make Broadway work. And Broadway can be you know, phenomenally successful both in terms of attracting audiences to your building and, and revenue, um, but it's also a available program where if you don't have the resident companies, you know, you depend on traveling Broadway to just have utilization of your building. So there's that financial thing of, you know, build 2,100 seats. And you know, Nashville because they're not it's just the concert hall and they're not doing Broadway, it had the luxury of saying, you know You can say a little song. You can do what works acoustically. And Myerson is a shoebox with a 
or the, the horseshoe in the back. Right. But if you look at the sidewalls, mm -hmm. it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Good question here. Yeah, a broad question about uh, the future of performance spaces and how you feel about your leadership in that. I'll try to be slightly more specific in that I don't think I'm talking about as much about symphonic or classical, but a broad array of music. And I'm also, in thinking about this, to get an answer from you, is thinking about the experiences you've touched on. That when people are thinking about going to a venue, they're thinking about buying a ticket, they buy the ticket, uh, what happens, are they going to have dinner before, what about socializing, uh, what happens once they enter the performance venue, uh, what the, the, the event happens, what happens if there's an intermission, what happens immediately after the concert. Right. Um, and so I know that's sort of a big broad question, but how do you feel about that? Well, when we, because we do, we, we basically do the soup to nuts, our firm does, um, in terms of how we approach a project and when we can be brought in. But we'll work with uh, initial planning and feasibility studies. And those are the questions we ask at the outset. There's the obvious question, the seat count, as Craig was talking about, is um, financially based. But then there's its position in the city. Um, and, and how accessible it is to the types of audiences that want to be there. There's a great conversation about where Nashville, where the Skirmerhorn would be placed, and there were two sites, maybe Craig can elaborate that on a, in a second about downtown or up on the hill. Um, but we, as we're talking with the users and the operators of the hall, everything having to do with where people park, how close is it to other um, area uh, things like restaurants and, and retail, um, and how people get into the building. All this is very important in what we call the programming part of the process, which is is not just to say here's a list of spaces, but here's the priorities to that list. You know, what, how is the building loaded? Is it there's you know we're doing a project in Salt Lake City, the parking is in the back of the building, so we put this beautiful galleria that gets people from the back of the building to the lobby, which actually fronts on the main street. So it, it, you have to deal with um, issues where you really don't want to front the building where the parking is because it's kind of the backside of the, of the main street. So we're looking at all of that, even prior to any architectural um, concept of the building, there's the planning of the building itself. And all those elements that you described are part of that initial study. You know, if any of us up here or anybody else in the room has the answer to your basic question, you know, it could be, you know, manna from heaven to the performing arts world because they're under all kinds of difficult challenges. Um, you know, one, lack of government funding compared to the rest of the civilized world. Um, and two, the lack of music education in schools, public schools, even private schools. And um, we were talking about this at dinner. Um, 1997, when we first started working with the Cleveland Orchestra, I had a debate with our client, and you know, he, their average age of a season ticket holder, subscription series person, was 51 years old. And I said, "Well, what are you going to do to, you know, lower that?" And he said, "I don't want to lower that. Eventually, everybody's going to be 51." Well, I don't think he would give that same answer today because the person who was 51 in 1997 had music appreciation class when they were in high school. Or if they didn't, their parents did. We are now in a generation that not only are the kids not getting the music appreciation classes in school or music classes in school, their parents don't either. And, you know, it's an iPod generation, um, compressed MP3 files, you know, uh, people don't even know what good music should sound like anymore. It, it's not um, just, it's just not music, it's also the live performance experience. Yeah. So it's not just the concert, but, you know, you could say one is extreme as, as Broadway, but uh, to me, I grew up with theater in my blood. I, the magic of going to an arena show or Shakespeare Broadway show is that intimacy with that performance is incredible to me. That's that's what's in my blood. You, you know, he has music, I have theater, but that
that the same thing has been happening. That, that the appreciation for the live performance is in this, you know. But I think that's changing, Bob. I think I think. hope it's changing. Well, I do. I, I, think, so I, I, I really think that the, the live, and I'll speak about music experience, I do think there is a, a real desire for live performance of all types of music. And the other thing that's exciting is the, the blending of the different forms of music. Uh, mm -hmm. With, uh, I'm thinking of Bela Fleck playing in, in our, our opening concert. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a concerto that Bela Fleck and Edgar Meyer uh, wrote with Zakir Hussain with the National Symphony. It was fantastic. And that, that blending of, of, of forms uh, is, is exciting. The other thing, the other trend that I see is, is the desire for small and more intimate venues. Uh, the, the room in San Antonio, Paul McCartney played in it last night. It's 1,700 seats. I don't think he's ever played since maybe back in the Liverpool. James Taylor set up the big stage that way. Right, right. You know, so. um, and since we're, you know, a bunch of architects in this room mostly, bringing it back to the architecture, all I can say is, you know, openness, accessibility, and flexibility. Um, you know, we had clients who wanted a neoclassical room. The building committee chair takes me to the conference room window and points to the Parthenon and says, if you can give us this, I'd be happy. Well, our job was to come up with a light and airy and open and more glassy 21st century classicism for Nashville. Um, and I think we really achieved it. And to, again, you know, we have an education room. We've got lobbies that can do double and triple functions. We've got the convertible floor. Um, just coming to a room that can do all kinds of things. The, the pick point, you know, allows that I showed you do that, or scattered over the ceiling, um, allows us to add production capabilities to, you know, hang additional light trusses to fly things, etc. to, you know, be able to do lightly staged opera in the concert hall. Um, st stuff like that. Um, it's just flexibility and openness is, you know, the architectural key. Mar Marty Stewart played that, that weekend, mm -hmm. and I remember him saying, well, this feels like Nashville's living room <laughs> for music, yeah. and, and it has, and it has a wide variety of music. Anybody else?